You might be wondering how to handle sensory issues. It's clear that everyone has sensory preferences, things that feel good to us for whatever reason that they do. And many of us have what might be called sensory issues as well. These are things that might bother us at a higher level than is normally expected. One of the things that makes humankind so infinitely interesting and worth the effort is not how we're all alike, but rather how we are different. Sensory differences can cause challenges to social situations like the school and even the home setting. But what can and should we do about it? What is the process of how to handle sensory issues? This week on the Just 7 Steps blog. Hi, I'm Robert Schramm, a behavior analyst, education specialist, author, and dad. And I'm also the developer of the seven steps to instructional motivation. Each week, I provide you with helpful information based on the Just Seven Steps approach. So if you haven't already subscribed to my Just Seven Steps YouTube channel, take a second, do it right now. I am certain that you will be glad that you did. In today's blog, I'm going to try to touch a bit on the topic of sensory issues. What are they? How they affect our children? and what we can or should do about them, if anything. I know an amazing young lady who is in her early teen years who has a disorder called misophonia. Misophonia is sometimes called selective sound sensitivity syndrome. It is a syndrome in which the person is particularly triggered with negative feelings and an immediate fight or flight response to what most people would consider normal everyday sounds. Most people with misophonia deal with sensitivities to sounds related to breathing or chewing, but some sensitivities to certain singing voices or even traffic sounds is also possible among others. When someone has misophonia, they have an oversensitivity or in a severe negative reaction to these specific sounds. Imagine if every time you sat down to eat, each person at the table pulled out a chalkboard and began scratching their nails down that chalkboard throughout the duration of the meal. Well, this is what it can feel like to someone with misophonia. Imagine trying to eat a meal happily with that happening, or take an exam in school, or even listen to your teacher when the boy with the cold next to you is scratching the chalkboard over and over again. Not all sensory issues are going to be related to sounds. Uh, people can have visual sensitivities to light, People can have tactile sensitivities to certain textures or materials, and there can be taste and texture related sensitivities in food as well as those related to motion. Any one of our children's senses can be affected by what someone might call a sensory sensitivity and may cause you to wonder how to handle sensory issues. When your goal is to help your child to live their happiest, most successful life, you have a lot to consider in determining how to handle these sensory issues. The biggest issue is when the concepts of happy and successful clash. A child with a sensory issue can be happiest when they're getting the right amount of that sensory input. This could mean more or less of something than what might be expected. If our only goal was to make our kids happy, then we could just rearrange the environment around them to assure that they have as much access to this optimal level of sensory input as possible. But what are we supposed to do when our child's happiness and their success may in some cases be mutually exclusive? A successful diet includes certain levels of vitamins and minerals, as well as a combination of food types. But what if the only thing that makes your child happy is eating french fries and getting them to eat anything else than that makes them unhappy? A successful level of activity in a school classroom is usually limited to being able to remain seated for stretches of time. It might include not responding vocally to stimuli that might otherwise be fun to respond to, or could include maintaining close proximity to people who make you uncomfortable or bother your senses in some way. The bottom line is what do we do as parents when what makes our children happy also makes them less successful and vice versa? Well, this is the question I've been asking and that we've been asking in the autism education world for many years as these types of sensory issues are quite commonly found among autistic individuals. Parents who are neurotypical understand the complexity of social norms and often want their children to benefit from the same types of social understanding that they have. 
This means that in some situations, behaving or acting like everyone else to fit in. And sensory issues can often cause children to behave or act in ways that might be socially less appropriate or even unacceptable in some settings. For instance, the child with misophonia I mentioned earlier gets anxious and then eventually gets upset when people she's in close proximity with breathe heavily through their nose or smack their lips. She will get up, she will ask them to go away, and she often can't even eat with her family. Now, it's natural for parents to worry about their kids and want to help them to avoid disappointment and any emotional pain. So it's not uncommon for parents to want to find ways to eliminate their child's sensory issues if they can. Some sensory issues can certainly be worked on. Improvement can happen and some can even be eliminated over time. But there are some important factors that come into play in determining if eliminating or reducing sensitivities is likely or even possible. And there are factors that might determine whether or not it is even appropriate to try. Firstly, you have to consider the sensory issue itself. Is it something that doesn't harm the child or anyone else physically? If so, maybe it's not an important consideration. If it's not harming the child or anyone else, and the child can continue to react to this sensory issue in ways that do not cause any harm, maybe it's not a worthwhile goal to target. Next, you need to see if the sensory issue is causing any other delays or detriment to the child's ability to learn or develop the skills they will need to be happy long term. In this instance, we're looking to see if the child who might be reacting to a sensory preference in the moment is able to continue to make reasonable progress on other important goals, or does the reaction to the sensitivity interfere with their growth and eventual happiness? For example, if a child is bothered by other people eating, but they can continue to grow and learn and develop important skills throughout the day, well, then it likely isn't as concerning of an issue. However, if the child's sensory issue is that they want to be rocking back and forth with their eyes closed and humming songs, and this behavior is desired strongly enough that the child is doing it throughout their day, not being able to stop to focus on other important things, it might make it more appropriate of a goal for us to target. Another consideration is how strongly the child feels that need or desire to engage in the activities related to that sensory issue. On a scale of one to 10, where would you and your child rate their compulsion or desire to engage in that activity? The lower the number, the more likely you will be able to put into place a successful plan to help reduce it. A child who is feeling a desire less than five probably can avoid the behavior related to it enough to learn and probably wouldn't need our help. If they are a five to an eight, it might be a good target for us as the child is bothered by it, perhaps the feeling of it, but they may have the ability to control their reaction and could benefit from some of the strategies that I will discuss next. Now, if the child is feeling that desire at a nine, or a 10, it might be so strong that any attempt at this time to reduce or eliminate the behavior related to that sensory issue might be too fraught with unhappiness and pushback to be successful at this point. Probably the most important aspect of deciding if a sensory issue should be worked on by adults is if the child themselves wants to change the behavior or the sensitivity and cannot do it without your help. There are those who would argue that unless the child wants to make the change, you shouldn't be focusing on it. Now, I can't quite go that far personally, but I do believe that anytime you are determining what to help a child with, working on things they want to work on is certainly the best place to start. Once you're able to determine if a sensory issue is one that makes sense to address, meaning that it is in some way dangerous or harmful to the child or others, it is creating other important delays that are likely to harm the child's future happiness. Um, and the behavior is currently in a range of importance to the child that success could be reasonably expected. Then you can consider a few options to try to address these issues. First, give the child access to the sensory desire at times it can be available so that they're not feeling deprived of it at times when you want to work on reducing it. If the child likes physical activities or massage or tickles 
or even joint compressions, certain types of foods or textures. You want to make these things available to the child when they can enjoy them without problem or detriment. If there are serious social concerns, perhaps you make these things available in locations of the home that are more private or less socially dependent. Teaching a child to wait for privacy for certain behaviors is a part of growing up for every child. It can certainly be part of the education related to how to handle sensory issues. Second, consider which of these sensory issues might be able to act as reinforcement for other behavior. If a child is strongly motivated to have or do certain things, these items or activities would likely act as strong reinforcement. And rather than working to try to reduce their value to the child, we just use them for their value that they offer us as reinforcement for other behavior that they would need to learn or activities they should be participating in. If your child loves jumping on the trampoline and the bed and the couch and on your lap, then in addition to giving this for free at times that it's not detrimental to them, use it as a reinforcer by allowing it and making it more fun when you do it together after they've demonstrated good behavior choices. Through the behavioral principle of pairing, these good choices they've made will likely increase because of their relationship to the preferred stimulus. And because the stimulus is being paired with things that the child might consider work, the items they enjoy that are problematic will likely reduce naturally as well. Third, for sensory issues that are not beneficial for their reinforcing value, but instead relate to escape from uncomfortable or even irritating situations, you might be able to organize a program of desensitization. This is slowly building up a tolerance in careful but meaningful ways to the sensory issue over time. However, I would recommend saving this approach for when you are working with a professional who understands the ins and outs of how to run it safely and correctly. And again, the best bet for this type of sensory issue is not necessarily to try to change it, but rather to help the child learn how to cope with the environment in ways that allow them to avoid and if necessary, respond to the triggers when they occur without using behavior that makes them worse or makes things worse for them or anyone else involved. Sensory issues are just one of the many types of things a parent needs to be able to understand and deal with when raising a child. Calls for help from the school, fights, talking back, bad hygiene, refusals to cooperate, to go to sleep on time, screen time issues. They're all things you might have to overcome when raising a child. And regardless of the issue, the best way to understand how to handle it is to have a solid grip on the important parenting principles that guide behavior. Learning the Just Seven Steps approach and using it to help you problem solve any issues that come along is the best way to be the best parent you can be. So for more information about the approach, come check out my free workshop called How to Get Your Kids to Listen Without Raising Your Voice or Nagging. The workshop is completely free and you can participate in it by going to the Just 7 Steps workshop at just7steps.com forward slash workshop. It takes less than an hour to complete, but it's chock full of great advice. And of course, you can't beat the price. Now to recap, if you are wondering how to handle sensory issues that may be bothering your child, you have to really decide if this is something that is worth addressing or if it is just part of the normal human variance that makes us all special. To work on something, it would always be best if it's something that your child wants to work on. But if they are not able to give you that information, you will need to determine if the issue is something that is actually physically harming to your child if not, you need to consider if it's causing any delays or detriment to your child's learning or development that will meaningfully affect their long-term happiness. And finally, you need to gauge how strongly your child is currently affected by the sensory issue. If you do determine that working on it with your child is the right choice, then consider how much of the sensory desire your child has access to and make sure they get enough during the day so that they don't seek it out or can accept not having it at times it's unhelpful or might be considered inappropriate. Use it for its reinforcing value if that is possible. And if it is related to an uncomfortable or irritating situation for your child, you can consider finding help so that you can develop a safe but effective desensitization plan. However, as we do for the child with misophonia I told you about earlier, 
Sometimes the best bet is to help the child learn how to protect themselves and avoid their triggers, to use coping strategies when they can't, and to work to keep their behavioral responses to the triggers as mild as possible. And don't forget to get a more fully functioning idea of how to use the Just 7 Steps approach. Come see us at the website for our free workshop at just7steps.com forward slash workshop. I know you'll be glad that you did. If you like this video blog, I would love it if you would leave me a comment, give me a thumbs up, uh, share the video with others who might benefit, and subscribe to the Just 7 Steps channel for more parenting content. It only takes a moment of your time, and I can't stress how helpful it would be for me and for other families who would benefit by seeing this content. So please subscribe and comment. Uh, it's easy to do, and it truly would mean a lot. So I'll see you all right here next week. But of course, that's only if you remember to subscribe.